not to, not to criticize the speaker line. So uh, my job is to talk on step two and three. Uh, I have been sober since October the 28th of 1984. I am 35 years sober, and for that I am truly grateful. I'm telling you, it's been nothing short of a miracle. Uh, just celebrated uh, my 35th year about uh, five months ago, and I just turned 62 uh, last Sunday. So uh, I got sober when I was 26 years old. I came into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous believing that my mother died when I was eight, and that's what caused me to be alcoholic because I believed that you had to have a cause to be alcoholic. I didn't realize today, I believe personally that it's a genetic bullet, uh, and I got it. Uh, my sister didn't, my brother didn't, but I got it. And uh, so when I start, I can't stop, and I can't stop starting. That's what qualifies me to be alcoholic. Uh, I think a lot of people misunderstand that, and I'm so glad I get an opportunity to talk a little bit about the second step and a little bit about the third step. I'll tell you, uh, one of the things is I, I'm, a, I'm a step technician. I love, I love talking about the uh, actual step and what the book says about the step. And I'll weave in my experience in sobriety. I, I find it more important to talk about being sober than talking about being drunk. I think there's a time and a place to talk about my drunkalog, but I just don't necessarily think this is it when I'm teaching the step or, or uh, using the experience of the step. Um, I uh, came into Alcoholics Anonymous at 26 years old. I had a five-year-old daughter. I know pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization. Uh, you know, I, I think everybody's got values. Uh, you may not be able to apply your values, but everybody's got an innate sense of value. And I knew dragging that little girl into places she had no business being was wrong, but I could not stop. I didn't understand why I couldn't stop. I had a lot of problems with outside issues. I thought outside issues was the problem. And, uh, you know, leave my drinking alone. I'm totally fine with that. But come to find out, the more I begin to understand alcoholism, I, I get it. And so in step two, I love it because it says we agnostics. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I was a big fat cheater in school. I mean, I cheated my way through school from the second grade on. I'm, I was damn good at it. I can tell you that. And, uh, and I just, I, I probably had a learning disability of dyslexia today. I've never been tested, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And so I lost interest quickly in school. So I, I'm a con artist from the get go. I still am a con artist today. I, I try to work the program to the best of my ability, but let me tell you my default setting, if you scare me bad enough, is to con and get what I need. And at 35 years sober, I, I, I don't, believe in the philosophy that you get a certain age and you stop the behavior. At least it's not been my experience and I haven't met anyone in AA yet that it has been. I've had people say they think it has been, but I've watched them. I don't believe that. So um, in We Agnostics, one of the things was that since I was a cheater in school, I remember I was handed the big book when I got sober. I got, I was taken in another room, got qualified for, you know, are you alcoholic or not? I didn't realize that I was going through the testing process, but I was. I was very fortunate that that happened to me. I, I didn't fight it. And then when I looked at the big book, I saw the chapter, We Agnostics. And actually, when my mom died when I was eight, I had no idea. I, I remember, it was back in 1967, for heaven's sakes. We, it was a different day and age. We didn't have, you know, people sitting around in grief groups and sending off balloons and, you know, doing all these you know, pictures and stuff. It was just kind of like, wow, your mom died of kidney disease. We're going to, this is not going to stop us. My dad ended up remarrying three times uh, in an 18 month period. And we had four live-in housekeepers. I let you just absorb what I just said. Uh, my, my husband, Charlie, likes to say, boy, he could, he could close a deal. That is very true. He could close a deal. And, uh, but I always thought that's what made me alcoholic. But today I understand that that's what, uh, it, it really just formed my old ideas in life. And where are my old ideas found? They're found in a third column of a four column of inventory. They're found in a third column of a, of a, or actually a second column of a fear inventory. I mean, there's many different places in the inventory process where my old ideas are dug up. And that's why it's so important to continue this process of inventory. There's nowhere in the book that says chill. And, and I didn't, I, I chilled, I chilled for, for about, uh, 15 years. I had about three years sober. The gifts of sobriety took me away. And, uh, and I rested on my laurels. I was all about staying sober. I went to five meetings a week. I was all about service. I did everything, but I did not continue to work these steps. I really misunderstood a lot. 
Nobody was out there, you know, dragging me to places I shouldn't have been. I just was doing a lot of stuff I shouldn't have been. I didn't know it. So when the girl hands me the book and she hands me, uh, you know, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I see we agnostics. I know I don't have to read that chapter. I really didn't get anything out of Bill's story. You try to read the big book without somebody teaching it to you, best of luck, man. It really needs to be taught by somebody that understands it, somebody that's had it taught to them. And if you really don't understand the big book, ask people. We'll, we'll, we'll help you out, man. There's plenty of people that will help you learn the book. And so I, I thought, well, you know what? I'm not agnostic because I, they, they told me when I was young in 1967 that God needed your, my, my mom more than I did. So I thought, you know what, whatever this God is, I got no business. I'm not interested in him, you know, kiss my butt. That was my attitude. And I carried that through life. I always believed there was a God. I was raised Catholic. I believed there was a God. I just wasn't interested in it. So I was actually agnostic. And the word agnostic means one who neither affirms nor denies the existence of a personal deity. You know, these, these words in the big book are very important. Our big book meeting is a primary purpose group in Austin, Texas. It meets on Tuesday nights. When we get back to meeting, which I know you're all praying, we're going to get back sooner than later, right? Just keep that going. Uh, you know, we are people that sometimes like to, 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 to stay in the fear and worry. Believe in the laws, man. The laws say believe it, it will happen. And uh, it's 2701 South Lamar in Austin, Texas on Tuesday nights at 730. We study the big book line by line. Week after week, we, get, we have a 1936 dictionary. We look up these words because these words mean something. They meant something then that they don't mean today. And, and so, you know, we agnostic, one who neither affirms nor denies the existence of a personal deity, right? This is what our, our program, I love we agnostics. It is one of the most profound pieces of literature. I encourage you to study it. How do you study literature? You take in your morning time, take a paragraph read the paragraph, and then go back through and turn statements into questions. Ask yourself what each line means to you. Don't just answer it quickly. Give it some real depth. That's what spiritual literature does. It goes deeper and deeper. It meets you right where you are. And I love our, our programs. It, it, it's an intimate, it's about an intimate relationship with the creator. It's not about learning what the creator is or who the creator is. It's about an intimate conscious contact with the creator. I'm telling you, in AA, we throw the gates so wide open, but we, we don't care what you want to believe. That's the beauty of what we have to offer. But we have two things. That's identification and power. That's it. The identification to be alcoholic and whatever power you want to believe in. Other than that, man, that's all we got. If you're not okay with that, I always tell people, if you got a real issue with God, so did half our fellowship. You know what I mean? Half our fellowship had a problem with God. That's not unusual. But let's not try to change what our, our basic tenets and our principles because you don't believe. You're going to come to believe. We don't care what you believe in as long as it's a power greater than you, period. So if you're not liking what you're getting, it's probably a first step issue. And if, if you're not willing to get there, man, head on down the road, Jack, till you're ready. That's, you, you know, you got to sponsor a lot of people to have that attitude, and I qualify in that area. I sponsor a lot of people. I always like to say praying for God's will is, um, uh, oh, my, my screen just went out. Oh, well, praying for God's will is not easy, but accepting God's, it, praying for God's will is easy. Accepting God's will is not. And We Agnostics is page 44 through 57. He tries to explain the difference between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. I've always said, you know, when people are sitting in a meeting and they'll say, uh, you know, I sat there and I watched my sister drink a glass of wine and she left half of it there. I, I don't understand why she did it. Well, you should understand why she did it. And it says it right there on page 44. It says in the preceding chapters, you've learned something of alcoholism. We hope we've made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. Right there it was. We hope you've learned something about alcoholism. Your sister only drank half her drink because she's not alcoholic. See, we must understand who's alcoholic and who's not. It does say we can't say the man is alcoholic, but it says in working with others, we need to be sure our prospect is alcoholic. So my job is to get you to see if you are or not. I probably already know if you are. I, I want to be darn sure that I'm not getting a hard drinker into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous when they don't even belong there. That's a, that's a whole nother ball game. And oh, being by myself and not seeing the looks on people's face, I could go off on a tangent. I already feel it. 
Okay, then it says, if when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, eh, you're probably alcoholic. It summed up the doctor's opinion and all the way up to page 43 to explain what it means to be alcoholic. And I know that uh, Sheldon did a great job. I'm sorry I couldn't tune into this one. I was tuning into our home group meeting for the first time. And uh, so I know he did a great job because I've had the privilege of speaking with him. So that's what it says. I'm going to read it one more time. If when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, you're probably alcoholic. And if that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. There it is. Identification and power. Lack of power is our dilemma. Power to what? Power to alcohol, right? All the rest of the things in life, I'm driven. I'm not powerless over people, places, and things. That was a big misunderstanding. I thought I was for many, many years. I'm, al I'm powerless over alcohol. I'm driven by all the other things in my life. And that's the one we're going to get into talking about the third step. And then it says to one who feels he is atheist or agnostic, such an experience seems impossible. You bet your butt it does. But to continue as he, as he is means disaster, especially if, if he is alcoholic of the hopeless variety. Oh, I actually find that as a badge of honor. I hope you do too. I am, I am the alcoholic of the hopeless variety. I mean, there is, it is, it's in my DNA. I came out of a womb with it. I'm the glass half empty person. I'm never the glass half full. I, I said, what about me? I mean, life completely filters through me, everything. I'm not, when it says that we are selfish and self-centered, that doesn't mean stingy and conceited. I'm self-consumed on everything, even if my motive is good. In We Agnostics, it goes on to say to be doomed to an alcoholic death or death or live on spiritual basis are not always easy alternatives to face. <laughs> I swear to God, you th lob that out at the PTA meeting next time you're there. People don't get it. They go, so let me get this straight. You could be doomed to an alcoholic death or help have spiritual help. Well, it's, on, it's a no brainer. Take the spiritual help. We're like, nah, mm -mm, no, I'm not really quite sure. Not really willing to hang up on that. And that's what we're trying to get you to. This is not easy for us. We, I love it says, you know what, we are um, outright mental defects, full flight from reality, can't differentiate the true from the false. Thank you. I mean, there's not, we see that as something like, yeah, and so what? That's where we go. I, I swear, you got to ask yourself how current agnosticism shows up. Because the second step, like I said, is a profound piece of literature. I think we skip over it a lot. I think we think, is it, do you believe in God or not? It's not that. It's way deeper. So how does my current uh, agnosticism show up? Voice of reason. I mean, right now, and I'm not going to get into what's going on now much at all, but I am here to tell you, you're either angry or you're scared. And what you are is both. Because there are people out there that got no money, they've got, they've lost their jobs, they're scared to death. I mean, you name it, it's it. We as alcoholics are uniquely qualified. I'm going to try to say this without getting too emotional. To help the other alcoholic, period. That is your job. Your task is to go out there and to calm the people who are losing it. That is our job. If you're losing it, calm somebody. It'll calm you. That's the way this deal works. Oh my God. I mean, we have been given such a gift. Yes, is it scary? I'm not saying you're not going to have fear. I'm not going to say you're not going to get angry. Of course you are. But we, we don't get the privilege to stay there. We must do this work to get out of it. See, we, we've been given a gift and we can't forget that. We tend to think we, you know, oh yeah, but you don't understand. Or, oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. So we've got self-reliance or God-reliance. So how do I play God? I control, manipulate, I have expectations, agenda, I'm the judge, I'm the jury, I justify. My list is endless in how I play God, right? I love one, I think it's on page 44. Now, now here's one that goes, you know what? I heard what that chick said in Texas and I'm gonna go out there and just help people and, and I'm gonna get better. Good, that's good. Now, here's something else you gotta know. You gotta do your own work. You gotta live in 10 and 11. 
You got to have that evening review going, right? All this, all this morphs into er everything that 10 and 11 and 12 tell us to do. You have got to do that evening review. You have got to write, where were you angry? Where were you afraid? Put some real pen to paper in that evening review. Don't skimp on that. That's the number one thing that's going to open your eyes, right? To bring into your prayer and meditation. That, that 10 and 11, uh, the evening review in the 11th step, it's not the 10th step, it's the 11th step. The evening review is what broadens everything because I bring those corrective measures in on awakening. It says when I wake up, I look at my 24 hours and I am divorced from self-pity, dishonest and self-seeking motives. That's a big deal. Rest on that, especially with what's going on right now. I swear, we alcoholics, they, they, in Texas, they put us in a, in, not in a lockdown, but they said, please don't leave your house unless it's mandatory. Well, hell, everything's mandatory. <laughs> I got to go run the hike and bike trail. That's mandatory. I got to do this. I got to do that. I mean, we will justify anything to not play by the rules, but by God, everybody else better play by the rules. That's how we operate. The other thing I can tell you, I was out today uh, riding my bike because he said it was okay. And I'm riding my bike down the neighborhood and, and I start, you know, I'm going to say hello to everybody because my life's a parade anyway. Hello, hello, hello. And then I start taking notice that not everybody's saying hello back to me. Hmm. Huh. The next thing I know, I'm, I'm trying to see if they're going to look me in the eye when I pass them by. And I realize, my God, this is all what the book is trying to tell me in the third step. It's trying to tell me in page 44 is that I always have an agenda. I always have a motive. And I don't realize it until you don't do what I want you to do. So on page 44, I got a little ahead of myself. On page 44, if a mere code of morals or better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long, enough, uh, long ago, right? But we found that such codes and philosophies did not save us. No matter how much we tried, we could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. In fact, we could wish these things with all our might, but the, it wasn't there. You see, if I just go, I'm just going to be nicer, I'm going to be less selfish. People say, you know, I'm going to work on my character defects. The book tells me you can't wish them away or think them away any more than you could alcohol. It's like chicken soup for the soul AA. You got to get down and swallow and digest large chunks of truth about yourself. This is not something we dig doing. Trust me, I got to do everything I'm saying you. I've always spoken to you. I mean the I. If that bothers you, write about it. <laughs> write an inventory on it. You'll get to the place to where all of a sudden we want the world and its people to treat us right. Then it says on page 45, lack of power. That was my dilemma. What? We had to find a power by which we could live. And it had to be a power greater than myself. Obviously. Oh, you're kidding me. But where and how are we to find this power? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Not out there anywhere else right here in this book. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do counseling. That doesn't mean you can't do other things. But let me tell you something. You, this book is about getting you unblocked so that you can get connected to that power. This isn't about, uh, this is about a conscious contact with God is what we're trying to get to. Not sobriety. Sobriety is one of the many gifts that comes with it. We want you to get a relationship with God, but we got to get you unblocked, then keep you unblocked came to believe. That's what this is. Everything leans towards this, right? But where and how are we to find this power? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than you, which will solve your problem. That's the, the problem of today. That's not just the drink problem. I thought the drink problem was the finish line. I have always been a doer. Man, I mean, we, my generation worked when we were 13 years old, Da -da 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 -da. I could go on and on and on about it, but that's what we did. You pulled yourself up from your bootstraps. You didn't lean on your family for help. You just went and did it. That was what I was raised under. So let me tell you what. I figured once you got the drink off of me, I got it from here. And I had no idea I was making that deal. But the part of the book I would read is I would read certain things about being selfish and self-centered. And I think, oh, I was voted most likable four years in a row in high school. <laughs> that is not me. And I remember making that decision and moving on. Now, I didn't realize that for almost 17 years. I sat in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous doing a darn good job. Man, I helped people. I did everything I could. I sponsored. I think I was more of a life coach. But you know what? Those folks got help. I got help until I had the bottom fall out. And when the bottom fell out, I did not have anything to lean on. And that's where it's talking about in the fourth step is your foundation solid so far. 
because a tsunami is coming. What's going on right now for some people is a tsunami. For me, it's not that bad. I happen to be one of the more fortunate people that I'm not being as hit as hard as other people are. But I can promise you the tsunami's there. And there are some of you guys that are scared to death. And I understand that. If you want to write a fear inventory, I'll listen to it. And I know I'm opening that up to a lot of people, but I'm, I'm here to help. And I know that that's what this is about. When I was asked to do some of these meetings, I thought, not ever. I am not doing it. I'm not doing it. And I sat down in prayer and meditation. And I, wasn't in, I had said that. And I sat down to prayer and meditation. And within one minute, I heard the booming voice of God saying, oh, yeah, you are. You're going to help these people. And you're going to look into a little camera. And you're going to do that. And uh, I didn't want to. God dang, how many times do we not want to do it? All the time. But we do it. And amazing things happen. It's God doing for me what I can't do for myself. Left on my own basis, I'm telling you, I'd run the show and it would be okay sometimes and it would be really miserable. And then it says, as soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative, a, a creative intelligence, the spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, we begin to possess a new sense of power and direction. Not just power, but direction, provided we took other simple steps. We found that God does not make too hard of terms for those who seek him. Well, where are the terms? They're at the end of the third step. Stay close to him, perform his work well. In order to stay close to him, I got to get close to him. And then take care of God's kids, his drunks. See, we have to get unblocked. It's always a process of subtraction. It's the throne of judgment, the state of separation that I stay on. It's all third column stuff over resentment inventory. I love the part where each step tells us when to take it, how to take it, and why to take it. God, I love the book. Um, I get a little worried. I lived for a long, long time. I, nobody was holding me to this. I lived for a long time in what I call oral AA, right? Meeting, meeting based sobriety. Now, the only problem about meeting based sobriety is the fact that you don't even know that you're in trouble until trouble hits. And nobody's making you do anything. I'm not around people that are saying, don't work the steps. You know, I mean, I've heard that there are people out there doing that. I, in my 35 years, I have never heard that. But one of the things that worries me about open uh, of oral AA meetings is it becomes discussion. And we begin to state things that aren't even true. I think that things are being said right now that are not even true. But how do you know? How do you know what you don't know? You have one doctor saying one thing, another doctor saying another thing. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. So I sit back and trust in God and ask him, who do you want me to help? I, I swear, you know, we hear things in AA that step one, uh, you did it before you got here. Uh, steps one, two, and three, the same thing. You did it before you got here. That wasn't Bill's experience. That wasn't Bob's experience. It sure wasn't my experience. Uh, we, we have people saying the 10 steps, the evening review. No, it's not. It's a spot check inventory taken throughout the day. You know what? I didn't know it. I thought it was the evening review and I wasn't doing it anyway. So, I mean, I was this person. I'm not blaming. There is no blame in my game. I will never be in that blame game of what AA isn't doing because I was a huge part of that movement. I did not know it. And when you don't know it and you love AA and you're all about staying sober, I, I offer for your consideration to have an open mind in what I'm saying. Because when the bottom fell out, I was at 17 years sober. My husband got very, very sick, and I don't really have the time to go into this whole story. It was tragic. It was horrific. Joe and I had gotten together. I chased him into AA, and I was very lucky that nobody was the arbiter of my sex life. And, uh, you know, he was six years sober saying this is all wrong when he was in my vortex. You know what I'm talking about? And then when we were together for 20 years, and at about 15 years sober, something went terribly wrong with Joe. And come to find out he had a brain tumor. And it's a long, drawn-out story. It ended up being benign. It wasn't going to kill him. It wasn't lymphoma. It wasn't going to kill him. But he was never going to work. From that day, we walked in the hospital on for the rest of his life. The neurosurgeon sat me down and told me that from day one. Now, I don't know about you. We're a two-income family. His income was gone. I had a kid in college. I had a kid in elementary school. And I was in the fitness business. Have been for you know 30 years. So all of a sudden I'm getting older and I got to do more work. I am scared to death. And all I do when I get scared is turn to self-reliance. And let me tell you something, we went through hell for six years. We didn't, we couldn't get social security disability. I was pissed. I was driving a school bus in the middle of my uh, fitness career because I was getting the medical insurance that way. Like I told you, I'm a survivor, I'm a doer. 
Self-reliance did not fail me. Self-will is the only tool I came in here with. You want me to set it down? You're crazy. It worked for me most of the time. Some of you guys weren't so lucky. I was somebody who could convince a, 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 you know, an Eskimo to buy ice. I mean, I'm that kind of gale. That's not new information for me even today. And sure enough, Joe, at 23 years sober, we were not doing well. It was very, very difficult. And on page 14, it says, for if an alcoholic fails to enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he cannot handle certain trials and low spots ahead. And we hit a day that was a low spot. Let me tell you what, Joe Gordon couldn't survive it. And he relapsed. And he went back out. And within 18 months, he went from what I considered a vibrant man to the guy uh, standing on the side, uh, flying a sign. You know, no, no, no disrespect, just the fact that that's what he, where he went. And he went right down the tubes. And let me tell you something, in 18 months, he ended up dying of a heroin overdose. And he'd gone out at 23 years sober. And by that time, I had 15 years sober and I was in real trouble. And I didn't know it was what I call untreated alcoholism. I wasn't treating my alcoholism. I was treating it with meetings and service. I was not treating it with the steps. So I offer that consideration for you. I mean, this is all kind of weird because I can't read your faces, but I'm hoping that you, you're keeping an open mind here. Do, have you been writing inventory? I hadn't written a piece of inventory in 15 years. I really didn't have a sponsor. You know, I was running on Katie Power because it worked for me, you know, and I'm in the bedevilments. My God, the bedevilments are on, on page 52. I like to say, you know, staying sober is the bare minimum. I didn't know that. I thought it was the finish line. Bedevilments on page 52 said we, were, we had to ask ourselves why we shouldn't apply our human problems the same readiness to change our point of view. Hey, let me ask you this for, for the gazillion people out there. Consider these questions sincerely. Answer them in your own mind. We were having trouble with personal relationships. Anybody having trouble with personal relationships? We couldn't control our emotional nature. We were either depressed or we were rageful. We couldn't control our, uh, we were prey to misery and depression, right? That's anxiety. The new term for anxiety, right? Fear is what anxiety really is. We, were, we couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to others. Oh my God, I checked off every one of those. But I was, I was bring, making a living. I was bringing it all in. And what I didn't understand was that I was not working the program of Alcoholics Anonymous for what it meant. I had done 10 years of codependency group therapy. I'm not knocking it. I learned so much about myself. It helped me tremendously, but I'm a self-reliant kind of girl. So what I did is I worked on me. And let me tell you, I can learn how to speak. I can learn how to get in front of people. I can learn how to convince you that my idea is a better idea, yada, yada, yada. And I could get people out of my way that I needed out of my way. I was an extreme example of self-will run riot, though I didn't think so. And that's what the third step's all about. I think the third step is deeply misunderstood in AA. And I give credit to my sponsor, Marty Ruby. Let me tell you what, that girl gets a text and she takes that text and she can teach you that text like nobody's business. And she taught me about what this third step really meant. I love where Dr. Bob says, uh, uh, the directions are clear cut, but everybody has a different experience. Sometimes we get lost in that statement. We sit around waiting for somebody to share my experience so I can get it. I don't have to have your experience. I don't have to uh, uh, horrifically lost a child, uh, been sexually assaulted, uh, uh, been fired. I don't have to have had these things done to me in order to understand. My job is to, to help you see selfishness and self-centeredness. That's it. I'm not your life coach. I'm here to help you see where you made decisions based on self that later placed you in a position to be hurt. I'm in the different angle business. That's an entirely different angle. The third step says that we started on 60 to 63 is where we live. The third step says that I'm almost always in collision with somebody or something, even though my motive is good. And the 10th step says we've ceased fighting anyone or anything. That's, that's 24 pages of action that we will run from, we will hide, we will do service work, we will make more meetings, we will do anything we can to avoid doing that work, and we don't even know that's what we're doing. I'm telling you, it's, a, it's cunning, baffling, and powerful. I always like to say the third step is way more than a prayer. It, 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 you know, we tend to rush people through the third step. I call it the second surrender. It's easier to get an alcoholic to stop uh, drinking than it is to get us to, it, 
quit playing God. It's a very funny thing, you know, uh, tell me to quit playing God. And I'm like, oh, I'm not playing God. Anytime I'm in self-reliance, I am playing God. You see, it doesn't mean we can't use our minds, but the book is constantly telling me to check everything, not check my motives. If my motives are good, this should go really well. It usually happens when the show doesn't come off very well, right? Alcohol was the solution. It was not the problem. Remember, I, I can quit drinking, but I can't quit playing God. Uh, alcohol was the only thing that treated the pain of living a life based on self-will for me. On page 62, it says selfishness and self-centeredness that we think, that's the first hundred who wrote the book, is the root of our troubles. Do you believe that? Turn statements into questions. I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. I step on the toes of my fellows and they retaliate. There's the first period. That's very interesting, right? So what does that exactly look like when I step on the toes of my fellows? Well, let's hear the rest of it. Sometimes they hurt us seeming without provocation, but invariably we find that we've made a decision based on self, which later placed me in a position to be hurt. So I like to use the example of this one. Say you, somebody walks into a meeting and you don't really care for this person. That's not a hard stretch for any of us. And they walk into the meeting, you look over at them, they look at you and they kind of give you this. Now, I don't really care for them, but I don't really want that. The heck is that? Mean? You know, next thing I know, I'm sitting there going, they go to sit down. Oh, and now they're sitting by one of my buddies. Oh, I see how this deal's rolling out. Okay. Okay. And I mentioned to my buddy over there that I didn't really care for this guy. And I bet he told him. I know what's going on now because you see, I am driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. I have to have a storyline immediately from this. That alone sends me to the moon and back. That's all it takes. And that's what I'm talking about. You see, I don't even know I'm doing that. And the next thing you know, I can't hear a word in that meeting because I'm thinking, look at John over there talking to him. Well, I know he told him I didn't care much for him. So now, yeah, but he doesn't know that John doesn't care much for him either. Yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. So now I'm going to go after the meeting. I'm going to buzz it over to John and go, so did you tell uh, Mickey that I don't care much for him? Really? Really? And John's going, whoa, what? You see what I mean? We step on the toes of our fellows. They retaliate, seeming without provocation. But we invariably find that I made a decision based on self that later placed me in this terrible position. See, it's in my DNA. I don't think too much of myself or too little of myself. All I think about is me. That's it. We joke about it. And I give you, okay, fine, fine, fine. Joke about it. But it's serious. It's a real serious matter. And I take it very, very seriously because a lot of times we can get, get by with a lot of sarcasm and a lot of elbow in it. But little do you know, that's in the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. The rest of the world, oh, they don't find us so funny. I always like to say, if you don't think you're an extreme example of self-will run riot, next time you're in a group of people that aren't in, aren't in AA and you start to speak, watch for this. I mean, that a lot of people is, whoa, because we're a lot coming at you. We don't think we are. We think we blend. We are a lot coming at you. On page 60, it says in italics, we were at step three, right? But then on page 63, it says we are now at step three and it's not in italics. I think that's important to kind of understand. I missed it all. And I think it's in italics because it's getting ready to say the many different ways that self shows up, right? The fourth step is my DNA. It's actually my blood work. It's going to sh tell me how Katie shows up when she gets scared, how she shows up when she gets angry, how she shows up when the sexual instinct comes in the room, right? It's really kind of a, um, a conduct inventory, the sex inventory. But at first, the first run is typically going to be with the sex powers. But after that, we're going to do it as a conduct inventory. How do I show up as a neighbor? How do I show up as a sponsor, an AA member, an employee, an employer, a sister, you know, that kind of deal. But so, so it's getting ready to tell me the many different ways that self shows up. And then page 63 is really the, the prayer is the affirming that I'm getting it, right? And, and we're going to move right on into doing the inventory work. There's no sitting on any step, not one step do you sit on. It's all action. And I love where it says, which is that we decided to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. I didn't get what that meant. I think a lot of people don't understand what that means. Today, I get it better. 
What, when it says that we decide to turn our will, that's my thought and my life is my actions. So it's always a cause and effect. My thought, I think something, and then I take it into my actions. We constantly are working in cause and effect, cause and effect. It's always my outward condition. I'm thinking if I get my outward condition correct, I should feel, feel okay inward. This is an inward job. Uh, always my external is a demonstration of my internal condition, right? We have a problem internally, not externally. And that's why we keep on that, that uh, hamster wheel. If I could just get the better job, the better relationship, the better car, treat my kids better, everything would go fine. You start to get that and we're not okay inside. Internal condition. Now, I love what it says. Just what do we mean by that and what do we do? What a fair question. The book asks beautiful questions, right? Its main object is to get you to get connected to this power. That's what it's going to tell us. So it spends the next two pages explaining what do we mean. And then it switches to what do we do? And that's the beauty of this third. I mean, this textbook lays it out beautifully. And here it is, page 61. The first requirement is that Katie's got to be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. We are almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though my motives are good. I'm here to tell you guys, I was not convinced for 17 years. It took me four years to come out of untreated alcoholism because I was in what I like to call the teenage years, right? Between seven and pretty much 18, where you know it all. You can't, it, it's, that's the hardest group of people to teach to. And if you're that, that's no disrespect. It's a piece of information from somebody who's been there, done that. We stand there and we take, uh-huh, yeah, I agree with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Bias confirmation, that's what we do. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, I agree. Well, let's be sure we look. Never stop being the student. I love to be the student. I've been watching, following a ton of people doing their steps. I love sitting at these Woodstock things and, and absorbing what they're saying. And if I get a little rub on something that somebody said, that means I need to look at that because I'm, I got a rub because my ego says, I, 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 we're, not, we're not from that school of thought. You don't go down that road. And I've learned so much by that rub. I am not always right. I know that's hard to believe. Charlie, if you're listening, I am most of the time right. Okay, so if my, we are almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motive is good, what does that look like? I think some of y'all were like, oh, don't lean into the camera too far. I was told not to do that. Mm -hmm. So what would that look like? My motives are good. See, I don't know that I have a kind motive. I, I'm going to let you in in traffic, right? Sure. Go ahead, because I'm a giver. And then you come into traffic and I'm looking for one of these. Now, I don't know that. Today, when I was riding my bike, I'm waving at people. I'm looking for them to wave back. I'm like, you didn't even look at me. Uh, I, I can't even believe it. And I saw myself doing it right away. So what do I do? I go into some prayer and go, God, these people are scared. If there's something I can do here, if I can just be kind and, and go by and wave, a, wo a woman that was probably, God, she had to be, 85 years old in her front yard just waved at me really big and I thought oh absorb that Katie don't pick the people who are looking down at their feet or their phones they're scared you, you are not the center of their world or or here's when you hold the door open for somebody you, you darn sure better say thank you if you walk through that door on your phone and never acknowledge me I'm trying to figure out how to kick that back foot out from underneath you had to go down and it, whoa whoa what just happened hey sorry about that I'll leave I'm, I'm terrible. I'm terrible the way the mind works. See, I'm not responsible for my first thought, but I am responsible for my second thought. That's what the 10th step is about. I am to watch my thinking. My first thought is uh, pretty ugly. And if you don't think yours is, well, then just watch it. Test it out. See what it is. See, uh, my, I, I, I work with good intentions. I didn't mean to hurt anybody. Charlie and I go round and round about this one. You know, when I tell Charlie that hurt my feelings, he goes, well, Katie, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. So if he didn't mean to hurt my feelings, he doesn't think he needs to give me an apology. I always like to say, look in here. Do you see anybody in there that gives a shit what your motives were? My feelings got hurt. Now, I'm not the girl that walks around constantly saying my feelings are hurt. But when they're hurt, I'd like for you to pay attention. And the same goes with Charlie. When Charlie says, Katie, that really hurt my feelings. My first thought is, what? And I just go, no, I, I, can't, I can't be a hypocrite. If that hurt his feelings, that hurt his feelings. You know, this is, the book says that we are in, in the 12 and 12, we are incapable of forming a true partnership with another human being. I know, 
your butt puckered right there. I'm telling you, that should get you scared. That means a neighbor, a sibling, a intimate relationship. We are incapable of forming this. So people, you ask an AA, how many people are currently, you got to say currently, you got to qualify, currently married? It's shocking. Why? Because we're so self-centered. We make it very difficult to live with us. And for you guys that are married and you're both alcoholic, hats off to you. Okay. Uh, uh, it says that I'm the actor running the whole show. I'm forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in his own way. How do I show up doing that? I am the sheriff of the world. I kid you not. That is the way my mind works. I'm better than I have ever been. My buddy Lorenz gave me some inventory work uh, that it, it was remarkable. I've written this piece of inventory. We were going over it. And he said, you know, Katie, what would happen if you took the high road? And I remember thinking, <laughs> I don't, I've never had a plane. I, I don't even know how to get there. Yeah, yeah. I ask you the same question. How do you get there? And he said, hmm, that would be for you to zip it. So for you guys that can't speak, it's as hard for you to speak up as it is for me to shut up. You see, it's just the different ways that self shows up. So when Mike said, what's your big fear behind that, Katie? And I said, well, I'm, fra I'm afraid if not me, who? And he goes, oh, somebody's going to come behind you and take care of business. You don't have to be the one. And I'm telling you, I was at a conference with the taper, John, who I love dearly. And the conference, the, the chairperson was up there. There's about 500 people in the room and nobody is shutting up. And this person is not being able to control the crowd. And I'm getting madder and madder. And I thought I'm going to march up there and say, there is a meeting going on. Zip it, people. And I sat there and I thought, no, no, no. This is not my circus, not my monkeys. I don't get to do that. I'm a guest here. Do not do that. And John came out from behind and he leaned over and he said it and they all got quiet. And I thought, Mike, that's exactly what my big fear was, is that nobody would do it. If not me, who? And I got to witness it. And the more times I take the high road, the more times I get to witness it. I don't need to step into the middle of this one. God, please help me not step into the middle of this one. Now, I, I still am the AA cleavage police. So if you're showing a lot of cleavage in an AA meeting, I will march right on up there to you and tell you, hon, I can't tell. Ooh, that is a lot of boob, you know, under boob, over boob, side boob. It's just a lot of boob showing. And, uh, and what I want to tell you is uh, uh, you're not going to attract the women over here to you. You know, you're a threat to the women if you do that. You'll get plenty of the boys. But I mean, come on, guys. Is it hard to get laid in Alcoholics Anonymous? I mean, all you got to do is wear a potato sack if you're a girl. <laughs> you get laid. Okay, that is not a hard thing to do. But the truth of the matter is, as I tell her, I said, what's the problem here, man, is you, the women don't want to come around you if you're over there putting it all out. You're a threat to them and a threat. And the men, you know, they're just all over you. So that's what I try to tell her. And I, and I mean, they'll put a pin in it. They'll do all kinds of stuff. If you come over there, I, I always say the prettier the woman is, ladies, we need to go to her immediately. Stop this nonsense of seeing her as a threat. I, I've never cared for people going, you know, I, I've never, women going, I, I've never liked women. Oh, whatever. In the bars, that's one thing. In the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, that's a whole other thing. Let's do the work and quickly get over that. You know, we, we are your ally. We are your number one person you want in your corner. Okay, I'm off on a tangent. <clears throat> then the delusion says, if only my arrangement would stay put. If only people would do as I want. Oh, Katie Topia. How difficult could that be, right? I take my motives, which are stellar, and then I take my delusion, if everybody would do as I wish. I run my actions through it, and, and the worst I'm going to get is an A-, minus. but instead I got everybody pissed off at me, and I can't figure out why. See, I'm going to always explain, explain my motives to, to you. And I love where it talks about the toolkit of self-will, right? We're always the actor. It says I am forever trying to arrange the lights to see. It doesn't say until you get long-term sobriety and you quit. We are always trying to arrange the lights to see. And if everyone would do as I wish, the show would be great. Everyone, including myself, would be happy. It is utopia. That's what we, we wake up. I always like to say we wake up with restless, irritable, and discontented. We either go to happy, joyous, and free or down to the four horsemen. 
Trust me, we are, we, people are like, oh, I'm kind of stalled. No, you're either going forward or you're going backward. There is no stall here. This, this illness of alcoholism never takes a rest. And watching my husband go out and within 18 months, it was, it was heartbreaking to see 23 years of sobriety down the tubes that fast. He had picked up, uh, as it, it wasn't where he left off, it was 23 years later he was still using. That is a fact. The toolkit of self-will and trying to make these arrangements top of 61. Our actor may be kind, considerate, patient, generous. I'm a giver. Uh, even modest and self-sacrificing. But if he doesn't get his way, what does he get? Mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. And let me tell you something. I, I love this story. It's worth telling. Charlie and I were in the airport and, uh, you know, we do the airport a lot. Uh, we, we fly Southwest a ton. Everybody knows us. We are, we are the yin and the yang. You know, we're both the goodwill ambassadors of the world. We know everybody. Our personalities are exactly the same. And we walk in there, you know, we see the baggage guys. Hey, Dave. Hey, Randy. How are y'all? You know, walking in there doing our thing. And we get up if we're A-list preferred. So we're standing in the hot shit line, you know, and that we're next in line. You know, the whole rest of the group has to stand there. I got absolutely no problem walking through that. Some people go, oh, that bothers me. I'm like, man, it doesn't bother me. So we walk over and there's a woman behind the counter we've never seen before. Well, she hasn't had the privilege of meeting the Parkers. So we walk in there and walk up to her and we're like, hey, how you doing? It's Katie and Charlie. We're celebrating Charlotte, you know, and, and she gets to meet us. And then little do you know, and little does she know, my bag weighs 52 pounds. Because it always weighs 52 pounds. I can't get it under 52 pounds, okay? So don't tell me, why don't you get it under 52? I can't. I try. It doesn't work. So I don't realize I'm working an angle for that person behind the counter. And so she, Charlie puts my bag up there, and she goes, oh, I'm sorry, that's 52 pounds. You're going to have to get two pounds out of there. And all of a sudden, the, the Goodwill ambassadors are like, do what? She says, yeah, you're going to have to get that out of there. I'm like, oh, come on. And she goes, no, you're going to have to. So I have to reach down there. I have to pull out something. And I'm not, I'm not the girl that opens my bag in the airport. So I reach in there and I pull out my, my curling iron and it gets it down to like 50.5. And she says, that will be fine. Like she's doing me a favor, right? That's the attitude I got. She's doing me a big favor, but I don't see that. And I stick that in my bag and the cord's hanging out. And Charlie puts his bag up. Well, his bag's 51 pounds. And if any of you guys know us, we travel heavy. And that's just the way it is. You know, I know people are like, well, I don't understand it. You don't have to understand it. We travel heavy. That's our situation, not yours. So Charlie Ron's got 51 pounds. And puts it up there and she goes, sir, you're going to have to take a pound. He goes, you got to be kidding me. And he goes, so you want me to take my loafer out of my bag? And she goes, yes, I do. He reaches in there and he takes his loafer out and he sticks it in the top of his briefcase. Well, all of a sudden, it's not going right. We're not, we're, we're mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. We're ready to get away from that girl. We walk away from her and I look at Charlie and we say some choice words, as you can imagine. And uh, my, <laughs> my curl and iron cord's hanging out of the back of my bag and Charlie's loafer's in the top of his briefcase. And I go, oh my God, Charlie, that was the toolkit of self-will right there. And he goes, oh, it absolutely was. And I looked at him and I said, but I can tell you something, we're not walking back over to her again. <laughs> you thought I was going to say we're going to get the bags down to 50 and not do that. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing it yet. It's still, I'm still not there with it. It's not objectionable to me. I'm going to try to work an angle. And in the worst case scenario, if I don't work an angle, I'm going to try to at least be nice when I take my curl iron. Okay. So I want you to understand we are not lily white. This is just the nature of who we are. And I love, I live in this paragraph. I'm at 49 minutes, by the way, for any of you guys. I'm going to try to cut it off at 60, so hang in there with me. So now we're in the paragraph that I live. I am the suicide hotline for my sponsees. I'm not the sponsor. This is how I sponsor. This is not how you need to sponsor. I, I am not, you know, I'm not your life coach. I'm not going to be at your wedding. I'm not going to be at your baby shower. I'm not going to be at all of these things because I sponsor a lot of people. I lose perspective if I get too close to you. If I become your really good friend, I lose perspective and I no longer like the clothes you're wearing, the, the, the job you got, the boy you're dating, and I don't know how to tell you. And so I keep a distance from my sponsees. That's just the way I do it. So you call me with a 10th step, right? That's what we're working on or questions with how to sponsor or things like that. But I'm not going to be the one who tells you what job to take, what boy to date, all that stuff. 
That's not my risk. My job is to be the vessel to get you connected to the power. So the power tells you, not me. You don't want me managing your life. So here it is. You call me with the 10th step, right? You're watching for resentment, dishonesty, selfishness, and fear, and you're pretty wrapped around the axle. Hopefully it's just in thinking. Hopefully you haven't had the knockdown drag out, but you may have. But this is, you know, we take the 10th step off the wall. It's damage control. But the longer you've been sober, it becomes in just watching our thinking. So what usually happens? Oh, this show doesn't come off very well. She begins to think life doesn't treat her right. Huh, there's the self-pity. I mean, good gosh, how many of you guys think life's not treating you right? We're riddled in it if we're not careful. And a lot of us have it very good. There are people out there that don't have it very good at all. We have an opportunity to sit here and talk about this with thousands of people. So I'm in the self-pity. I decide to exert myself more. Here's where I'm driven by the fever. I become on the next occasion still more demanding or gracious. There's the toolkit of self-will, as the case may be. Still the play doesn't suit me. Admitting I may, may be somewhat at fault, I'm sure others are more to blame. That's the, the, the line. There's only a couple of lines in AA now I wish I could get rid of. I, I've preached them for many years. Today, now I wish I could erase them. And that's the one that it's my part. It's your faults and your mistakes. It's not your part. It is your faults and your mistakes. That is a big difference. And so admitting so, and we may be somewhat at fault, we're sure others are more to blame. Blaming others was as far as most of us ever got. The inventory, disregarding the other man entirely, the inventory was ours. Oh, that's a whole new set of rules that I wasn't used to. You hear inventory in all of this. Another thing I have a little trouble with is when people say, well, I have high-end problems. I hope you have high-end problems. You have the gifts of sobriety. Yeah, you're not, you're not you know, necessarily living like you used to live. You actually have a mortgage payment. You have a car payment. You have car insurance. You might even have children that you're taking care of. Those are high-end problems, but a problem is a problem to a drunk. It doesn't differentiate. Don't be ashamed of, the, of your high-end problem. You paid too much for a pair of shoes, and now you can't pay your rent. Let's talk about it. You know, there's no shame in my game. There's no judgment in this deal. Then it says, what's the basic trouble? Is she really not a self-seeker even when trying to be kind? See, a self-seeker, I, 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 I have a couple of words that I get hung up on, and that's codependent. I, I don't, it's not our terminology. I'm a self-seeker. See, I don't always want approval from you. I just want you to do as I wish. That might be approval from somebody else. It might be something different but it's a self-seeker even when trying to be kind. We always want to cloak that in some sort of newer, newer age terminology. People say, I'm, I'm a people pleaser. Oh, oh, that sounds like a real giver, a people pleaser. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we bring in all the people that you please and line them up along this wall and see how lovely they, they how happy they are to have you in their life. And the truth of the matter is, is you're an approval sucker. It's not a people pleaser. I always say, you want to know a, you want to know what uh, what the real people think about you or what people really think about you is to go get three people that love you dearly and say, I need you to tell me three things that you see about me that I do that really bother you. And then sit there and listen. Then they might be scared to tell you. But I'll tell you what, you will, you will advance this work so much faster. And then it says, is he not a victim? of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he just manages well. Wow, is there a lot packed into that. The word victim means I'm tricked or duped by my own delusion, right? We don't suffer from a disease of denial. We suffer from a disease of delusion. Well, the 1935 dictionary, are you ready for this one? It's an impression that is firmly maintained despite being contradicted by what is accepted as reality. Ah. Typically a symptom of a mental disorder. Again, another butt pucker right there. Yeah, I'll read it. Impression that is firmly maintained despite being contradicted by what's accepted as reality. Now, that's like saying to somebody, did you tell so-and-so this? And they go, no. And you go, well, they're lying. That's it, right there. You, you did not believe that they said, no, they didn't. You believe they're a liar because you're going to maintain what you believe. And then have you ever heard the term, would you rather be right or happy? Oh, I want a person to slap the crap out of you, but oh, I can give you the right answer. But I want to be right way more than I want to be happy. I want to be right and happy if I can get them. But if I can't get them, I want to be right. And so it says of the delusion that we can rest satisfaction, right? That means to seize by force satisfaction. That's being right. 
and happiness out of this world if I only manage well. This is a very tricky little thing. I always like to say, I'll kill both of us. Man, I, I am not a suicidal girl, I'm a homicidal girl. Isn't it evident to all the rest of the players that these are the things she wants and don't wish her actions make each of them wish to snatch and retaliate everything they can out of the show? You've been around that person that's just, you know, uh, uh, Eddie Haskell on uh, um, Leave it to Beaver. Hello, Mrs. Cleaver. It's an awfully beautiful dress you have. And for any of you millennials that don't get it, you Google it. I've Googled enough of your stuff. So you know, that's what I'm saying. I mean, most of us are just like, hey, I'm going to show up and be this Celsi. I'm kind. I'm the, I'm the uh, chameleon. And then it says, is he not really in his best moments of producer of confusion rather than harmony? You're completely passive, passive aggressive. Anybody can see passive aggressive. You can see straight aggression, but passive aggressive makes you crazy. I always like to say it's like trying to hold on to a wet fish. You can't get a hold of it. You tell somebody, is that what you meant when you just said that? No, 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 I, no, I didn't mean that. You can't ever get them to admit anything. Ah, they make me crazy. And, and this is where the amends comes in. It's always constantly about either forgiveness or asking for forgiveness. That's the two things that come out of this. There is no justifiable resentment. <clears throat> and the way self-will shows up, right? There's many different ways. Self-talk, be very careful of this one. It's like when I walk in somewhere and I know I'm nervous. Katie, you got this. There's no God in that. It needs to be a prayer. Story stealing. All of a sudden, somebody starts to say something and, and it reminds you of something about you and you just jump right in there. You don't care about their story. You want to talk about yourself. Oh my God, I can see it in others, but I'm blinded to it in myself. There, and so then it says, so our troubles. This is only for the people who, who see it. So our troubles are basically of our own making. You see, if I want to be free, the problem's got to be me. They arise out of ourself, and the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, comma, though he usually doesn't think so. There you have it. Most of you think, you know, we've grown out of it. Oh, no, we haven't. Then it says many of us had moral and philosophical convictions we couldn't live up to no matter how hard we tried. I'm telling you, it says neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by working on our or trying on our own power. It's just a whack-a-mole. You can't fix self with self. Self-knowledge is important to have for the awareness, but the awareness is that much of it. Oh my God, it's important to see what's driving me, what my values are, what my old ideas are. This is all the inventory process. But the true nature comes out of columns three and four in a resentment inventory. It, depending upon how you do a fear inventory, it's going to come out in the second and third columns. Uh, the fourth step is a is is really a consideration of how Katie shows up. I love what it says at the end of the third step. It says, though our decision was a vital and crucial step, what decision is that that I'm going to quit playing God? If that's all you get out of the third step, you have missed it greatly. It is not about not playing God. It's about the many different ways that self shows up that you play God. It, I've talked to people, I was talking with somebody that said, I just need to pray more, I need to pray more. I'm, I'm, no, you don't. You, you, could, you can throw your prayers out there all you want, but if you're blocked, God, you couldn't hear God if you had a bullhorn. You get scared, you go into self-reliant. You need to write inventory, scratch it out. We mentioned inventory and people think it's like the first overhauling we did when we first got sober. It should take you no more than six minutes to write inventory. Scratch it out on a bar napkin, you know, very quickly. Just get it down. It's not, not a long process. We've got all these old ideas on what writing inventory is about. I, I can help you out. Okay, so then it says, so the fourth step is a consideration. Though our decision was a vital and crucial step, it could have little or permanent effect unless at once, followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom. What? I thought liquor was the problem. We had to get down to causes and conditions. And that's where it stops, just what do we mean? And now it goes into the beauty of what do we do? <clears throat> we had to have God's help. This is the how and why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. Why? It didn't work. That's me having to know everything. I gotta be watching for these things to be able to start this whole ball rolling. Next, we decide here's a decision that God was going to be our director. He's the principal. We're his agent. The word agent in the 1935 dictionary means I'm to, I am to act on his behalf. 
I am not to be the one that tells you what to do. I'm merely the one, the vessel to get you connected to the power. Uh, I, that's carrying a message of depth and weight. If you don't feel like you have one, let us help you get one. When we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer. If you've just lost your job, you have a new employer. This is good news. Being all powerful, he provided what you needed if you keep close to him and perform his well work well. There's the terms. Now, as we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, kick this around, guys. What is peace of mind? What robs you of peace of mind? My God, these little games on your phone, Candy Crush, I played it for about three hours and was obsessed. I had to, it felt like quitting smoking. I had to get rid of it right away. Binge watching TV, sitting at home doing nothing, clean out a closet, write a letter to somebody in prison. My God, there is so much you can do. Go for a walk. There, do get out of yourself. Don't do mindless nothing. As we discovered we could face life, can you? Turn statements into questions. Oh boy, I feel myself getting on a bandwagon. Forgive me, bear with me. I've been looking at a screen for, for an hour. Uh, successfully, we've become conscious of his presence. Turn statements into questions. Are you conscious of God's presence? Do you have a, a dialogue with your creator? God almighty, I never knew I could. I didn't for years. I didn't even know that was the point. We began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter. We were reborn. As I said in the beginning, praying for God's will is easy. Accepting God's will is not. I'm here talking to middle management, man. I'm talking to the guy with three, five, 15, 30 years that's not feeling it. I mean, I swear to God, the new guy is the blood, but the guy that's got time is the oxygen. The blood cannot live without oxygen. If you're not in the book, please get in the book. And if you are, I'll see you on the fire lines. Thank you very much.